just give you a really quick run through of the type of work that the Maritime um, Heritage Program, which is run by the, Mar by the um, Heritage Division, Office of Environment and Heritage. I'm the um, Maritime Archaeologist for New South Wales, um, and I run the Maritime Program. So I just want to run you through um, the scope of what we do, and then um, um, towards the end I'll give you a bit more of an example of some of the newer sites that we've been finding around Sydney Harbour. Um, we're quite lucky in New South Wales in, in a lot of ways. We've got the most heritage of any state. Um, we've got the biggest coastline, the earliest settlement. We've got the most divers in the area. Um, we've had the greatest area of shipbuilding up and down the coast. And we've also got a, a significant um, World War II losses and, um, and emplacements along the coast. Sorry. Um, when, people f when Gary first asked me to come along, he asked me to talk about shipwreck heritage. Now, maritime heritage goes far beyond that with the scope of what we do. Um, we not only cover shipwrecks, but we also cover maritime infrastructure sites. So that's anything's piers, jetties, wharves, baths, rock pools, um, any way that people use the ocean interface. Um, also, relics um, are, are covered from shipwrecks, such as anchors, so isolated finds where an anchor's been lost is also covered by us. Um, aircraft sites are another one that most people don't think about, but there's been significant losses up and down the coast here. Uh, over the years. And also we cover, um, just recently, under my banner, um, we've started covering, covering Indigenous sites, but I won't cover any of those in this um, presentation. Um, one of the, probably the most iconic wrecks that we've got in this state is the Dunbar. Everyone probably knows the story of it here, but for those of you who don't, the Dunbar was coming out from England with a, a load of um, new settlers to the state. Um, everyone had lined the cliff to see them come in and unfortunately the, um, due to bad weather the Dunbar smashed into the cliffs and people who'd been waiting to see their relatives had to watch them die at the base of the cliffs. Um, there was significant loss of life in that area and it was pretty one of the most iconic wrecks that we've actually got along the state here. And people still have strong social values of this particular site within the state. Is that better if I put that over there? Sorry. Um, during the um, 1950s onwards, with the discovery of scuba, um, um, scuba diving up and down um, um, the state, and, and particularly with um, Jacques Cousteau's invention of the um, aqualung and the scuba regulator, there was a big increase um, in people being able to visit sites, particularly sites that were beyond snorkeling depth. And um, in particular, the Dunbar got pretty hammered by um, divers in the early days. There was a lot of uh, material come off of it. There was a lot of significant material, including gold doubloons, coins, etc. But a lot of it also was significant material that was coming from, from people's relatives. It was actually belonged to people who still had um, you know, their, their um, relatives' um, belongings actually on that site. And what I want to sort of make a bit of a point with, with this, um, this talk is that um, Shipwreck programs all around Australia have been driven by community development. It was at the community's behest that we introduced the Historic Shipwrecks Act um, um, in 1976, which covered the um, Commonwealth shipwrecks, which goes from the low water mark out to the, um, the um, 200 miles offshore, roughly, um, and also for, for the um, Heritage Act of 1977. I won't go into all the red, red regulations, etc., because it'll put half a year to sleep. But um, basically, um, we, we administer Commonwealth sites as well too. We have delegation under the Act. Um, so it means that there's a seamless um, administration of shipwrecks along the, along the coast. Um, and that's um, common around Australia. Um, we're now in... Uh, the program was established in 1986, I think it was. So we're 20-something years old now. Um, as I said before, we, we administer wrecks under a number of different Acts. Um, but we also, um, the, some sides of shipwrecks are also protected under things like the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And there's also obscure things like the Customs Act actually protects some shipwrecks if they haven't cleared, if the items on board the shipwreck haven't cleared customs. If someone takes them off, they're actually still protected under that Act. There is a new move um, which is about to um, hopefully be ratified by Australia within the next couple of years called the UNESCO Convention 2001 for the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. And that's seeking to try and um, have a seamless approach to maritime heritage across um, Australia and across the world. I won't go into that in any great depth, but I can talk to people about it afterwards. Um, I'd also say that maritime, um, trying to pull in the, the National Marine Parks side of things, is that the, um, 
Marine Parks also administer the Historic Heritage Information Management System. And so wherever wrecks occur within those sites or where the sites um, occur within um, the national parks, they also have some mechanism of protection under those acts as well too, such as the K-9 submarine and a number of defence infrastructure sites around Sydney Harbour. Now, not all our wrecks are dry. This is one of the things that really surprised us um, just recently, probably about five or six years ago. Um, there was a big um, development, honeysuckle development up in Newcastle. Um, they were, um, thought they'd passed all the planning regulations, etc., and they started digging in reclamation areas, and they found this completely intact shipwreck, the Leo from 1876. Um, what I would say is, I, I'm going to touch upon this point a little bit later on, but that just don't think that wrecks are all off the coast and they're undiveable. A lot of them are, are well within development areas. Um, we find a lot of shipwrecks through coastal erosion. Um, this one here is the Buster shipwreck, pretty exciting wreck. Um, we go up there quite regularly. Um, we had a, one of the marine park ranges up, the, up at Coffs Harbour, David Greenhutch, often um, gets in touch with us and says, the Buster's out, and we go, yeah, yeah, OK. And he rang up the other, he rang up a bit last year and said, the Buster's out. And we said, yeah, right. And he said, no, the Buster's really out. And um, you can see here it was exposed right down to the Kilson. You can see the mast steps. You can see the chain locker and everything there. Um, we had a few problems with this wreck um, starting to fall apart, and so we went back up there to have a look at it. The day we got back up there, it sanded over again. So it's a, it's a natural cycle. Um, we're also finding a number of wrecks, particularly now, um, within the rivers. There was um, initially a lot of uh, work done in the Murray River, um, looking at um, sites that were dry along the riverbank during the, the drought periods. But we've since found probably, I reckon, in excess of about 100 wrecks in the rivers over the last four years. Um, one of the other types of sites that we're looking at within reclamation areas, particularly around Sydney Harbour, um, are maritime infrastructure sites. This is one of the most exciting ones we had in the last year or so. This is um, at Barangaroo site. You can see here there's a very early seawall runs through here. Um, and there was later generations of, of building in this area. So there were slipways, there was wharves. There was um, later um, um, areas where they were reinforcing the sandstone wall and they built generation after generation of, of, um, uh, of um, wharves and jetties on top of that, that area. And this has actually since been, um, been investigated and recorded by archaeologists as part of that development. Um, these sites also occur in the rivers. So if we're going back to the Sydney Harbour theme, this is... Um, a place called Lockyer's Wharf, which was um, basically up near Ermington. Um, it's a stone wharf. Um, it probably had a, a timber extension at the end of it, so a timber pit, small timber pier. But if anyone wants to find these sites, get onto Google Earth one day. That's how we found about another five of them when Tim first wanted me, my boss wanted me to first start recording this site. He said, I'm not quite sure where it was. And I said, there it is. And he goes, no, that's not it. That's another one. So there's at least five or six of these up in, in the um, Parramatta River that uh, people hadn't seen before. Um, we also maintain uh, the Maritime Heritage Database, so if you're ever looking to see what sites are actually in your area, um, you can go to this site, and um, I can pass some cards out later, and um, you can email me, I'll send you the con contacts for where you can find this site. Um, getting onto the, the sites that are around Sydney Harbour. Um, the Edward Long was probably one of the earliest shipwrecks in the, in the harbour, um, 1834. Um, there was 12 people um, killed on this wreck. Um, it was basically trying to get into Sydney Harbour and around um, to the, the early uh, wharfage. But unfortunately, there's such big storms coming through the, the heads at the time that it actually smashed to pieces underneath um, Middle Head and 12 people were, were killed as part of it. And it's an interesting um, observation of this site in that there's actually nothing left at all of this site that you can see in the seabed except for two anchors. And so what we, we try to play up and tell people when we're looking at these types of sites is there's a lot of people get really keen and go, oh, wow, an anchor, let's pull it up and put it in a park. But often when you're doing archaeology for shipwreck sites, it's the only thing that tells you there's a shipwreck there to start off with. There's probably smaller artefacts that are, exist in that, in that area, but it's, it's like taking... It, the way I put it to people is that it's like taking a jigsaw puzzle that you want to do, take away half the pieces and then take away the box lid which shows you what it looks like, and that's what a shipwreck's like. Catherine Adamson was an, also an early wreck, 1857. Um, it founded um, the North Head within nine weeks of the Dunbar occurring, and so there was, a, there was quite a large loss of life on this, 21 people as well. Um, I can't remember the name of the cemetery. Many of you will probably know it, but um, there's a famous memorial which has actually been um, made in one of the, uh, the older, oldest uh, Sydney cemeteries to this wreck. 
wreck site. Um, you can see it occurred right to the, very close to the entrance to the harbour. I mean, how would you feel being coming all that way from England? You know, gone through all the huge storms, etc., and then you, you basically get pounded to pieces within, you know, um, spitting distance of your destination. Sorry, I'll probably gone through this a bit quicker than I meant to. But um, Centennial was another wreck that's in the middle of uh, uh, the middle of the harbour. Um, it's basically near the Sow and Pigs Reef, which you can see down through here, which is the reef that se separates the two channels coming in and out of the harbour. Um, it's one of the largest wrecks that we've got here. Um, it's a UK iron steamer. Um, it's a very popular dive site, but can be quite murky in that, that area, depending on the time of the year. Um, and it sank after a collision with a, a vessel, I think it was the Adelaide from memory. Now, there's a lot of other sites that um, um, I think Jenny was mentioning first off that um, there's only 10 sites in the harbour. There's a heck of a lot more than 10 sites there, but a lot of them never made it into the original shipwreck atlas. Um, one of the things that I did when I first got up here, I moved up here from about four years ago from Melbourne and I was just familiarising myself with the bays, etc. I got onto Google Earth and did the same thing with what we were looking at with the, um, the wharves. And you can see here there's one, two, three and possibly four wrecks out here. This is the Atata, which was a um, barkentine, I think, from memory. There was many, many sites that you find around Sydney Harbour where um, as ships got to the end of their life, they didn't have wreckers' yards, like, you know, for the old car wreckers that you get now. And so what would happen is they would find a, a, what they thought was an isolated bay and they would take it up there and they'd dump all their junk up there. And so what was the, today's, you know, the old adage, what's, um, you know, yesterday's um, trash is today's treasure, has left us uh, some great examples of some of these sites. Berries Bay has got... Um, um, one quite highly visible wreck in there. It's um, what we think is called a bottom dump light lighter. This is the vessel here. And basically it was used for harbour dredging maintenance. And so what would happen is they would fill it full of harbour muck when they were dredging it and it would go outside the heads and open the bottom doors on it. And it would just dump it in the, um, the Sydney dumping grounds offshore. Now we were quite surprised quite recently in that there's another five wrecks have actually been identified in that bay. Um, what's been going on is that there's been various agencies around um, Sydney Harbour, including Sydney Ports, uh, and a number of um, private um, researchers have been using side scan sonar. And side scan sonar, if, if you don't know what it is, does everyone know what an echo sounder is? You know, it tells you how deep um, it is um, underneath you. It's an electronic device, bounces sound down. So instead of bouncing sound down, it bounce, bounces it out to the side, and wherein, wherever there's anything that's got any height on the seabed, it'll actually pick it up and it'll cast a, a shadow like you can actually see here. And so there was been another four wrecks has been identified in this bay just from using side scan sonar. One of the things that we're also finding lately is that um, there's a lot of um, wreck enthusiasts who, um, a bit like the train spotters of New South Wales, um, but they actually go out and they look for shipwrecks on the weekend, and so they go and do all the historical research, etc. Then they buy themselves one of these fish finders, which um, they've got a side scan sonar built into them, and um, they they basically go and do their own surveys looking for wrecks and we're coming across a fantastic amount of information. Now this is a um, very interesting site. This is one of the dumping sites that I was telling you about but it's actually off of Bull's Head. Um, now we knew of two wrecks off there, these two, which haven't been identified yet, but there's actually at least seven. So you can see there, there, there and there and this is all coming from multi-beam which is my, a more sophisticated version of side scan sonar. Um, these are all in about 90 feet of water and, and every time you go past on the, on the Parramatta Ferry you go past these wrecks. Now this is what I was talking about with community um, based research. There's a, and I want to pay particular tribute to a guy who's been helping us out a lot called Scott Willen who's got a, a web page called New South Wales um, Wrecks Online. Now Scott's um, a mining engineer by trade but has a lot of spare time on his hands. And what he's done is he's gone back through a lot of historical records, and I'm talking um, um, not only historical um, documentation, but he's also going back and reinterpreting a lot of um, remote sensing surveys, such as side scan sonar and, and um, magnetometer data. Now, everything that you can see on here is, is a hit that Scott's come across, and he's diving every single one of these to see what's at the bottom. And so far, he's found about at least 28 new sites in Sydney Harbour. Um, this one's a very interesting one. It's, um, he found this based on magnetometer data 
and that's what gave it away. When you do, when you do a magnetometer survey, you get a, a sine curve, so as you approach the anomaly, you get a, a peak, and then it turns into a negative peak at the other side, and that's very indicative that there's a large um, magnetic anomaly in the seabed. And when Scott dived it, he found this, which was the 1884 wreck of the, the Herald. And we were absolutely astounded. We didn't think there'd be any more wrecks that could be found in Sydney Harbour. And he's showing us very clearly that there's a hell of a lot more there um, that haven't been found before. And one of the things you can see on this, which is quite interesting, that's the boiler. And you can see the brass stopcock, which is still in place there. And it still had the, the silt boiler level tube um, still, still um, intact on it. What you're looking at here is... Um, that's the paddle wheel, what's left of it through there, and there's two boilers here and here. And that lies only about 400 metres off of North Head, going um, in the middle of the channel. Scott also went looking for another um, uh, anomaly. He, didn't, he wasn't sure what it was called, um, but he basically found this one. It's the um, colonist dating back to 1890. A very, very low um, profile site, so it was only pretty about off the seabed. Um, but it was just enough that it cast the shadow for him. Um, he actually is so enthusiastic that he in, ended up diving at night, about 2 a.m. in the morning, to check this out because the problem he had was it was in the middle of the Manly Ferry route. And so um, we, uh, we ended up getting um, Scott well on site in the end because we organised with the harbour master that he could dive between the ferries. And so he had a 10-minute bounce dive between the ferries and confirmed that it was this wreck, this wreck site. And so you can see there there's not a lot of... Um, relief to it, but there's enough on there. That's, that's initially what he, he was diving on, to try and see what it was. And that's, that at the top here is, the, is the, what's the remains of the shipwreck. And what it's, this proves to us is that there's a lot more left intact in the harbour than what we actually originally thought. He also dived another one called the Isobrook. This is the only known, sorry, this is the only known picture of the Isobrook here. Um, um, I can't remember the date of this one. I think it was about 1880, yeah, 1880, sorry, a German vessel. Um, and it was found off of Ladies Macquarie's chair. So this is the site just here. It's only about 200 metres off there and about 10 metres deep of water. And this is only found in the last year or so. You can see it's wonderful visibility. So, um, He also found another wreck. This is only going back to the beginning of this year, um, and it had 30,000 bricks on it. And we, at first we were trying to figure out whether it was actually a shipwreck or whether it wasn't, and what swung it in the um, favour that it was a shipwreck was that they were still stacked. And there was a number of brick barges which used to actually take bricks from um, one side of Sydney Harbour to the other, to Manly, to deliver bricks. And we think that it's um, this one called the Success, but there are about four other contenders for it as well. Um, so who do we work with? We work with New South Wales Water Police. We work with the, the Maritime Authority, our Manly Hydraulics Lab. We work, we work a lot with um, national parks people up and down the coast. Um, we work with commercial surveying companies, but we rely a lot on local people. We've, we have basically got me for, um, two, for the last two years and we've just got another person to help out. But it's long stretches of coastline and basically we rely very heavily on, on local people and communities to let us know when they found something. Um, so look, I'll leave it there. Um, basically what we're doing is we're sharing the stories. We're trying to keep these sites for people to dive on. We, we, out of um, the nearly 2,500 known wrecks, in New South Wales, we've got three that have protected zones around them, and that's because um, the majority of them still have people in them, um, and they they have fairly significant, uh, strong social significance to them. But you know, we encourage people take you know take um, leave only bubbles at the sites and take away fond memories and treat it with the respect that you would if it was your own um, you know social heritage site. Thanks very much. Thank you.